Well, well, well. As usual, the question is, what is going on here? What does this mean? Why am I tuned into Facebook and or YouTube and seeing this record waving around kind of unsteadily on my screen? What is this? Why is this happening? Well, I would like to think that unless this is a completely random occurrence, you have tuned in willfully and deliberately to this, the latest Malcolm Tent shoot interview. Yes, that's right, kids. It's been a while. I have not done one in a, about half a dog's age, but I'm here, baby. The Malcolm Tent shoot interview series doth continue. And as you might have guessed by the fact that I'm waving around a wide awake record, today we're going to talk about Connecticut straight edge hardcore. I hate to use the word legends because legends is such a tired, trite phrase, but I think in this case, justified. Connecticut straight edge hardcore legends wide awake. But before we dig into that, before we dig into that, we're going to get into the method behind my method. As you people know, if you've ever seen me on the various social media and internets, whether it be my fabulous Wednesday talk show, Tent Talks Tunes, or the Malcolm Tent shoot interviews, I'm a very task-oriented fellow. I'm very driven. I'm driven to achieve things and to accomplish. And there's always that ulterior motive, you know? Always a little something on the back burner that I'm trying to push to the front, right in your face. And today, it is, of course, relating to this, Wide Awake, The End, uh, a record that originally came out in 1991 documenting a red hot live performance by the aforementioned Wide Awake. You're like, Tent, you old creep. What has 1991 got to do with the current day and age? Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you. It's one of those strange, twisted, convoluted tales that I find myself embroiled in periodically. It's a weird thing, but it's what I specialize in. A little while back, in a previous day and age, I was visiting with my good friend, Jeff Terranova. Jeff, who used to, ho used to run a record label called Smorgasbord Records. And Jeff was the bass player, sometimes guitar player, sometimes lead singer, pretty much did everything there was to do except play drums in the band up front. And I've known Jeff for a very long time. And, you know, he uh, had to move his household and he was selling off a whole bunch of his, you know, remnants from the label and the distro. And in his big box of stuff that he was getting rid of, for some reason, he had 30 empty sleeves for this record, the Wide Awake at the End record. And, you know, it was just finally time for him to get rid of them. I didn't ask why he had them. Why ask why? I'm not the type of dude to do that. I just see them and I grab them. So the burden of having 30 empty sleeves shifted from his shoulders to my shoulders. But I had a plan. Already the idea was formulating in this somewhat aged but still very active brain of mine. I thought, what do you do with 30 empty sleeves? You fill them with records. What else do you do with an empty sleeve? I mean, I could have used them for packing material or wall art, or I could have laminated them and used them for shower tiles, many things I could have done, but I chose to fill them with a record. So that begs the next question. Well, there's only 30 of them. You go to a pressing plant, they expect you to do like usually a minimum of 300. Then you've got 270 records without sleeves and the problem just becomes this like ridiculous, multifaceted, unsolvable riddle. But there are ways to solve these problems. My favorite way of solving the problem of having a very small number of sleeves or a record that has a very small niche audience is to take advantage of good old Yankee ingenuity and send out the call to one of the people in this great land of ours who make hand cut records. Yes, you can still see me, I can see you. This, my friends, is a hand lathed record. It is cut 
on a vintage 1950s lathe. The piece of plastic is cut by hand. The hole is drilled by hand. The manufacturer takes it and places it on the old lathe where it spins, drops a cutting head onto the surface of the plastic, pushes record, and records the record in real time, individually, one at a time. When it reaches the end of the side, he picks up the needle, flips it over, and repeats the process, one at a time, in real time. It's laborious, it's time consuming, each one ends up being utterly unique. And since they're cut on 1950s machinery, by and large, they are monophonic, they're not stereo. They are monophonic. And in the interests of fairness and advertising, we build them as being lo-fi. They're not really that lo-fi. Um, it's kind of like the old computer, you know, the, the saying about computers that we used to have when programming, garbage in, garbage out. Something good comes in, something good comes out. So when it comes to a, a, compar a comparative listening test between one of these and a regular pressed vinyl record, these little bit short in the hi-fi department, but they're still pretty damn good. They're still pretty good and they're definitely listenable. And in the case of this Wide Awake record, which is basically a raw soundboard recording from the much loved Anthrax Club, it's really not that far off the mark from the original pressing. You could probably do an A-B comparison between this one and the original and spot some sonic differences, but by and large, it's pretty close. So that's what we got. I made 30 of these with the permission of the band members. They take forever to make. They're laborious. They're time consuming. They're expensive. They cost a lot more to make than a regular pressed record. But you know what? We built this city on record collecting. Yes, that's right. Anybody who was there at the time during the heyday of Connecticut straight edge hardcore knows that record collecting was the king of all hobbies. So I'd like to think I'm kind of bringing it back with this almost unique one of only 30 made handcrafted record. I took the original sleeves and on the back stickered over the information that is no longer germane to the present day. You can see there if my crappy camera focuses, it's numbered of 30 and it's got TPOS information where the old information was. And I think it looks pretty darn good. And I think it sounds pretty darn good too. And once these are sold out, there will not be any more because there are no more original sleeves. It's all she wrote. You're gonna have to send your saddle home if you miss these. So that's it. You, I got it, you want it. When this thing airs, there will be handy links posted in the comments section with ordering information. Take advantage of it. Don't lose out. Don't hate yourself for the rest of your life. I will, of course, be shilling this periodically as our interview series with my good friends Rob and Scott from Wide Awake continues. And guess what? We're going to start right now. Rob and Scott, welcome aboard. Hello. Somebody say something. You got to break can, the ice at some point. Can All you right. can you hear us? Are people yeah, like you? good to see? You. I can hear you. I can see you, and I have absolute faith in the technology that once this thing goes out on Facebook and YouTube, we'll all be represented. Everything's going to be dory hunky and copacetic. Nice. So, lot, so just on the ease of the technology and because I see what's going on here with the way my screen is laid out, we're going to go from left to right the way I see it. Excuse me, Scott, maybe introduce yourself, tell the people a little bit about you and your background and who you are and what it was you did and what it is you do now. All right. Well, yeah, my name is Scott Frosch and uh, primarily spent most of my uh, young years in Brookfield, Connecticut. Uh, that would be, you know, in the, uh, I think we, you know, we moved, we moved to, moved to Brookfield in the late seventies, uh, got into skateboarding and hardcore music, probably, uh, 85, 86, uh, met, a, uh, 
met up with Rob and the boys. They needed a fill in drummer. So I think it was the June of 87, if I'm not mistaken, that I, I came in as Rob. Would it be second drum? Uh, Robbie Mitchell, the first drummer. And, my, and there was nobody before him, right? No, yeah. Rob Mitchell was the first drummer and you were the second. Yeah. So I came in as the fill in as a young freshman. I just graduating as a freshman in high school and uh, uh, played on the demo, the seven inch. And we played a bunch of shows at the Anthrax, and that was at you know the tail end of the '80s. Uh, after that, I went on to I never stopped playing drums. I played in a lot of other bands. Moved, lived in Colorado for a while, then it ultimately ended up coming back here to Connecticut. So I'm was and uh, was am and probably will always be in video production. So that's what I do for a living. Uh, that's how I pay the bills: shooting and editing videos. Right on. It's uh, not a bad way to go, especially this day and age. I'm sure the last 16 months were busy as hell for you. Absolutely. Yeah, it was it was all editing. <laughs> it was all editing from home. And now we're just getting back into the uh, thick of it with uh, studio shoots and that sort of stuff. We had a whole backlog of uh, uh, stuff that needs to be filmed. Yeah. Right on. Right on. It beats the bread line any old day. For sure, yeah, yeah. All right, it's a pretty cool capsule summation. And believe me, we're going to get deep yeah. in detail with everything you talked about. In detail. Right, right. Yeah, you put me on the spot. I can't, can't give a, a, a life story in 40 seconds or whatever. But yeah, we can talk more about it for sure. Yeah. Most assuredly. All right. Yeah. Rob, chime in, man. Give us the scoop. Hey, I'm Rob Anderson from Brookfield, Connecticut. Um, like Scott said, I grew up skateboarding through town and that led to just one connection after another. But I met Rob Mitchell, I met John McLaughlin, I met Tom Kennedy. And, um, you know, we would listen to the Adventure Jukebox on WXCI with Daryl Ort and just record and just, just dive into the punk rock world and skateboarding. And it was just a really kind of cool time. And I forgot who it was. I'm pretty sure it was John because he was the talented one, but he had the idea to start a band and uh, I wasn't in it. It was actually John Sheehan from Bethel, who was the first bass player, Tom from Newtown and um, Rob Mitchell and John from Brookfield. And uh, I would roadie carry their stuff for the shows. Uh, and I don't know how long it was, a year or two before John actually had to move. He moved to Chicago. So he had to leave the band. And so I was lucky enough to be in the right place at the right time. Um, and this was right before we recorded the demo, the demo tape. So I was on that, um, which is pretty cool. And then uh, the rest, you know, happened. And um, somewhere in that timeline is when we met you, Malcolm, because you opened a store in Brookfield, which kind of just was like right in line with everything we were doing. and. Uh, it just kind of be like one good thing happened after another. Um, so I'm not sure where that fell in the timeline, but we met you and we were able to buy cool punk rock records and uh, have a kind of a pipeline to that world. Um, fast forward, I work for a really cool hospitality restaurant group who's owned by musicians. They're all guitar players. They're all into music and uh, they're great people. And now I'm based in Boston, Massachusetts. Right on, which is kind of a drag because now you have to go around constantly reminding them that Connecticut is not soft. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I'll represent. I'll represent up here. There you go. Cool. All right. So you've already like we we plowed the field pretty good, and I want to just this is the question I always ask because the one thing that struck me when I first moved to Connecticut because I'm from Florida originally, and I met Kathy who I opened the store with when she was living down there. And we both decided that Florida sucked and we had to get back to somewhere culturally friendly because Florida wasn't. And since she was from Connecticut, Sherman specifically, that's where we sort of set our sights. And that was uh, in November of 1986 is when we first opened the store. And the one thing that struck me when I got here 
to, to Connecticut was that the entire Northeastern idea of hardcore versus punk was very different from what I experienced in Florida. So maybe if you guys want to, and we'll, we'll, we sort of got like a sort of round robin thing going, we'll start with Scott. Like when you first got into the, the whole punk thing, were you aware of the, 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 uh, the idea of hardcore versus punk or was it all kind of the same to you? Or what was your, what was your gateway musically into the whole thing? Okay, yeah, it's a good question because for me, I was coming in via skateboarding. Uh, I was lightly aware of Wide Awake and aware those bands playing, but um, I was not really well versed in the whole straight edge thing. Although that being said, I was starting to, you know, become aware of like seven seconds and minor threat, but I was, if, you know, if Thrasher endorsed it or had, you know, Christ on parade, septic death, uh, corrosion of conformity, uh, ludicrous, you know, bands like that, Dead Kennedys, all that stuff. But Black Flag was, you know, probably one, you know, one of my ultimate favorites. And, you know, back then before the internet, we all we were just going off of like, uh, you know, what we see in the pages of Thrasher or somebody makes you a, du a dub of a cassette and, you know, just word of mouth, you know. Um, it was all word of mouth stuff and it was fantastic. I mean, you know, there wasn't like, you know, it wasn't like you're getting a lot of tapes like, oh, this band sucks. So it was all good. You know, it was especially when you're, you're, you're hearing it for the first time. Um, so there was a lot of like tape trading going on and, you know, rumors about bands and how do we get this thing? Maybe they're going to have it at record world in the import section, that sort of thing. Uh, so I wasn't going to shows. I was really kind of too young for that. I was probably about like 14 or 15. Uh, but, but the, the first show that I went to was that legendary Chatham Oaks show in Danbury that, uh, with aware and wide awake and no milk on Tuesday and crippled youth and youth of today. And that was that, that set the stage for like, you know, in the whole youth crew, positive youth insanity that was going to follow for the next few years. Uh, so, but then going to that show, then it was just like, oh, this is great. You know, I kind of got sucked into the whole youth crew thing. And, and uh, you know, be, again, being about 15 years old at the time, it was, uh, you know, it was appealing. Yeah. Yeah. It was like definitely the right thing at the right time, I would think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, all the, you know, it started off more into whole, like, you know, the, like I said, like the skate punk and the, you know, your standard, standard LA punk and hardcore bands. And then just kind of became more fine tuned with like the, the, the East coast straight edge stuff that was going on. Um, you know, and, you know, regrettably, I mean, like I remember even coming in and selling a bunch of stuff back to you, like misfits tapes and corrosion to conformity or whatever, you know, like, ah, this is ah, I'm beyond all this now, but uh, I'm almost 50 now. And all that shit's legit in my book, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's, 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 the dumb sales. <laughs> but, you know, but that's really funny because that's, that's a point that I sort of wanted to get to. And, uh, you know, Rob, chime in if we're, we're, um, talking about something that you can really lock into. Well, I would just kind of echo what Scott said was that this, again, for me, was really driven by skateboarding, right? This was kind of, we were heavy into skating and in that culture, um, and it was being fed to us from the pages of Thrasher and California. So we were so much aware of the punk, the black flag, um, and skating led us to youth of today eventually, really, because. Um, there was a strong connection there. So that's how it worked. I also had the added um, bonus of having older brothers. And um, before we moved to Connecticut, when I was young, we lived in uh, Bergen County, New Jersey. So my one of my older brothers, who's about 15 years older than me, 12 years older, maybe, he was going into the city and seeing the Ramones in 76, 77, and, and the Runaways. And so I was young going in his room and this is what he's into. So I had that exposure. So I was aware of kind of the, you know, the British punk scenes like uh, bands like GBH and um, Discharge and everything like that, but uh, it wasn't as prevalent. So I, I kind of was aware of, through my brother of this scene. And I did think that they were somehow connected, but the shows, like I didn't have the opportunity to go to a show to see one of those bands. It was just kind of always a, a you know, an American or punk band. So that kind of drove it. But um, yeah, there, there seemed to be, they weren't connected clearly, if that's kind of where you're going with that. 
well, no, that actually makes a lot of sense. And what Scott said a second ago about, oh, this, this is misfits and all that stuff, that's, that's got nothing to do with straight edge, you know, Connecticut hardcore, whatever. I was just waiting to use this term schism. <laughs> like at the time, you know, the, the lines were very clearly drawn between what was like Connecticut straight edge or straight edge in general and what wasn't. Yeah. I, yeah, because I feel like I started panning some of these bands that were, maybe I was just sick of them at the time or whatever, but like, I just, yeah, I felt like, you know, if you went, if you looked through my record collection in 1988, it was all just like, you know, not just straight edge bands, but like very germane to like New York City, like cro Straight Ahead, you know, it had to be from New York City, it had, you know, uh, in retrospect, I just, you know, I mean, yeah, you, you can't listen to everything at once, I guess, <laughs> Yeah, and especially at that yeah. age, you know, you're, yeah. you're just finding your way around, you're starting to really... Well, and there was an excitement to the fact that kind of we felt we were part of that, and this oh. was happening and building and gaining momentum, and to be part of something's pretty exciting, so you're obviously, you're excited. Oh, you know those guys in that band, and they're releasing a record? Let's get it, and, you know, listen to it, and that kind of was a, a little bit of it, but, um, yeah, I'd agree with you, Scott. No, that makes an awful lot of sense, you know, and that was always the difference between, you know, punk rock and as it eventually became hardcore was the fact that you could participate in it. You didn't have to buy a ticket and stand half a mile away and I guess that is Pete Townsend, isn't it? (laughs) Yeah. And that's what I always loved about it, you know. Um, It's really interesting that you you talked about some of the... um, the early lineups of the band. This is a, a fact that I've probably talked about before, but I actually, I auditioned to play bass for Wide Awake. Wow. What? True <laughs> fact, true fact. Very, very early on, this must have been, had to have been after the Chatham Oaks show, you know, because the, the, the Chatham Oaks show was on January 2nd, 1987. Yeah, and a snowstorm. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. It was, it was wild. And, um, I'm going to backtrack just a little bit. In my mind, once again, getting to the whole idea of schism and we are this and you are that, that show, I think, in a lot of ways, kind of threw down the gauntlet because, as you mentioned earlier, No Milk on Tuesday played and also Egg the Poet did his set, which was like performance art with, you know, tubes of toothpaste and funny outfits and whatnot. How, how much is that doggy in the chipper? <laughs> Exactly, a classic. Um, adventure, we had that taped from Adventure Jukebox. My friend and I used to play that over and over again. Oh my god, I loved it. <laughs> Hilarious. But you know what I remember very clearly was that he and No Milk on Tuesday didn't really go over that well. Do you guys remember that? You know, it's funny you say that. Like, um, the, the, because I I vividly re- I, and I've I've got a pretty piss poor memory. But I vividly remember No Milk playing and me being like, not like a hundred percent like this, like my cup of tea. But I was like, this, these guys are awesome, you know. Like, and 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 like I know they didn't quite fit in with the whole general straight edge posse core lineup of the night. But yeah, they were, they were cool, and they and definitely like if I go back and watch some of their stuff on YouTube now, it got more of an appreciation for it. Yeah, cool. I, I love Mike. I can play their stuff right oh, yeah. now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And enjoy it a lot. Yeah. But uh, that, and that kind of, um, I think, underscores why I didn't make the cut with Wide Awake. Um, and I wish I could remember, it, it must have been Rob Mitchell playing the drums. It had to have been. It and, was uh, Robbie, yeah. Okay. So we're going re- to rely on you, Mr. Anderson, for having a good memory <laughs> with these <things>. All right. <laughs> so I remember going down to John McLaughlin's basement in Brookfield and running through the set a couple of times. And... I, I kind of knew it wasn't going to happen because at the time, you know, I had hair down to here. Uh, you know, I was a, a couple few years older than the dudes. And even though to this day, I've never smoked a cigarette or drunk a beer or anything, I didn't identify as straight edge per se. So the vibe was just different and I didn't make the cut. And I'm mean, I guess that's where you came in, Rob. Yeah, I guess so. John didn't tell me about that. <laughs> <laughs> it was just, you know, one afternoon, you know, one afternoon. And, yeah, you know, I was probably just one of many faces in the crowd, you know. <laughs> but I know, 
I remember back, you know, back then you had the long hair and the beard. God, that would have been an interesting look for Wide Awake. <laughs> like I think it would have been actually pretty, pretty cool. Yeah, I used to love the guy that played bass for Sick of It All. Like he had you know, like like a mullet or a mustache or whatever. He he looked more of like a metalhead guy than the rest of the band. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I remember he he always stood out with the long, lanky brown hair and the kind of pink yeah. fuzz mustache. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, it was all about the unity at that time. Yeah. You know, unity. That's that's another great thing about hardcore is like when there, you'd have like this random shredder. You'd have like this band. It was all like positive, positive core kids. But there was one dude who like stood out. He was like an amazing guitar soloist. You know, like somehow they just needed somebody to play guitar. So they grabbed the local metalhead, you know. <laughs> right, right. Which kind of tied in too to the whole crossover thing, you know. It was, uh, you know, even Agnostic Front had a long, puffy-haired guitar lead guitarist, yeah, like the pink plastic guitar, you know. It was <laughs> really not that, really not that unusual. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And leeway with the two guitarists, right? With the one skinhead and one guy with long blonde hair, and it was just quite a sight to see them play. That's so good. Yeah, and they were they were great too. They were a really good live band. Yeah. So cool, man. We've got the, the stage is set and um, we've got the early history of the band and the lineup is just sort of coalesced. And that's going to bring us to a, a date that Rob mentioned earlier, which is June of 1987. And that is the very first Wide Awake recording to ever be released. And I'll bet neither of you guys remember this. But this... Oh, yes, this is the. Is that the show in New Milford? No, that is the No More Censorship Defense Fund benefit yeah. show from the Anthrax. Yeah, I was going to say that, that that had something to do with No More Censorship. I remember that. To say. But did, did we not do a similar show in New Milford with those bands? Hmm. Or am I just totally missing this, messing this up? <laughs> I thought we played with Apple and all those. I, for some reason in my head, I thought it was New Milford, but I guess. Oh. No, it, was that, it was the Anthrax. I got the tape. Was. Prove it, yeah. dude. I, I, got, I, I see it. Prove it. Again, so my memory may not be as sharp as uh, I'm yeah. credited for. Uh, such disillusion. Well, luckily, not only do we have the tape, but I wrote the liner notes, and the liner notes are here. Let's see if this jogs any further memories for you dudes. Wide Awake, doing the songs Everybody's Seen, Friendship, don't quit and brother to brother and this was recorded on june 6th 1987 a wow five months before the demo yo right wow. and that's like that's like three weeks before i joined the band <laughs> right okay yeah. now that makes sense because it's credited right here john mclaughlin on guitar yeah. tom kennedy on vocals rob anderson on bass and rob mitchell on drums so this also must have been like right after you, Mr. Anderson, joined the group. Yeah. Probably, yeah. No, wasn't it? I think it was more like, again, I'm losing it, but I thought it was closer to 96 or the, yeah, maybe the beginning of 97. So that wasn't long after. It was starting to play 90s in here. That's going to make us really confused. 80, sorry, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, the proof is in the pudding, dude. June. Yeah. June of 87. But I don't know. That's why we're yeah. trying to figure out what's going on here. And it's also interesting because of the, the lineup of the bands, and this gets into like the whole disparity of music. It was you guys, the Blood Impulse activists, Reverend Mark, Apple, and uh, oh gosh, who was the other band who headlined that night? Oh, I did a spoken word thing. Uh, this group called Puzzle House, Dirty Ernie the Poet, and the two-man rockabilly band, The Fearers. Pretty interesting. So how did you guys end up on that bill? Do you remember at all? I don't, but I assumed you asked us to play it somehow. It was something through John and you, I thought. Could be. I don't remember. <laughs> somebody, somebody walked into Trash American Style at the wrong time and got roped into it. <laughs> That's it. It's like, you guys are going to play this show. <laughs> Dirty Ernie. That, yeah, is he? I've heard of that guy, but I... I that's funny. <laughs> yeah, he was uh, apparently a, a real Norwalk stalwart. You know, that, er, that Ernst. <laughs> was that? There's a guy named Ernst. Is that Dirty Ernie? I don't think yeah. so. I didn't. He's, yeah. 
hopefully when this is broadcasting, people will be watching and can oh, they're like, yeah, they're gonna, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 And people are welcome. I, we want you to do this. You got to help us out. We need you to fill in the gaps and uh, yeah, get some of the information together. So by all means, leave comments and uh, yeah. comment section on this one. <laughs> yeah, it's it's going to be a big one, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> so that's cool. So what kind of, what do you remember about that early in the band's development like what kind of shows were you playing where were you playing who were you playing with what was it like we'll start with you, you Rob. yeah um you know i just remember being a lot of fun i remember being always just kind of excited because there was it seemed like there was always something new coming out right every month there so there was somebody was putting out a record or doing something. And there was always a connection through, we had played with them, we were friends with them, even if we just knew of them and watched them, but there was, so it was exciting. Um, you know, I don't think Scott and I were ever kind of picking these shows to play. Usually Tom and John were, were handling that. Yeah. Um, and usually we were just excited to go and and uh, play wherever we, we could go. So that's kind of all I remember about that. Uh, you know, I don't think, um, you know, we had any sense of uh, what we wanted to do next. It was just, we were in this wave that was really kind of exciting. And uh, that's what I took from it anyway. Yeah, what do you, what, what's your impression on that, Scott? Well, yeah, I was going to say, I mean, to get into specifics, it seems like censorship was a big thing back then. Cause, but the first show that I played, like, like I was very fast-tracked into this whole thing. I remember, um, uh, you know, like literally in Brookfield High School, it's coming towards the end of my freshman year, and John McLaughlin comes up to me in the hallway or whatever, and he's like, hey, look, man, um, we 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 might want to audition you to play drums for us we're losing robbie or whatever on drums would you be interested and i was like oh hell yeah let's do this or whatever so again much like you i went down to his living uh, basement or wherever the you know they had the setup there at john's house and we ran through the songs and i guess i did pretty good i was there for that one. Oh yeah 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 so so uh and I mean, we had a show, it was over in like Mayapak, I want to say. We'll be, hopefully Terra Nova chimes in on this because I still have like a little flyer. It's like the size of a business card. And it's, it's like, this ticket is your license to mosh or whatever for tonight, you know. But it was, it says on the bill, it was, um, it was up front, uh, it says New York Hoods. I, I don't remember them play. I, 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 we may have like played and left or whatever, I would, but I don't remember seeing New York Hoods uh so that was the first show i played that was fun and then the second show was the was amazing it was it was my first time at the anthrax and it was with side by side it was one of todd rantick's band it was like head, head on touchdown touchdown yeah 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 and token entry was the headliner and this is even in the in the sick of it all autobiography book they wrote token entry let sick of it all get up and play a couple songs using their instruments at the end of the night they're like oh this is going to be the next hot new hardcore band you guys got to see or whatever and they got up and just freaking ripped it apart yeah right at that that together compilation had just come out uh so that was a fun night yeah, yeah. and then i can't remember anything after that <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, you know that well, i do i do remember that show scott in particular when we played with touchdown yeah because I had just switched. I had like an Aria Pro 2 bass and I had gotten a, a Washburn bass that had a, like a pointy headstock. Yeah. And at one point during the show, I had like did, you know, some jump and the point of the headstock went through this kid's cheek Whoa. who was on the stage. And I, I, it was, I think it was one of Todd's friends yeah. that kind of, you know, cut right, right through his cheek. And I was oh like, oh, God, pointy headstocks are... Are dangerous. <laughs> like, wow, that's so cool, man. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there were so many injuries back then. I mean, you know, yeah. take, taking driving your buddy to Norwalk Hospital or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And they just carried him out. I didn't see him again after that, but it, he was bleeding from the mouth. Yeah. <laughs> so to this day, there's some guy walking around with a really weird, kind of like triangular yeah. star. Hi, we, we know. Okay. As, we know who you are. And yeah. <laughs> this is the guy. As, as, as long as it didn't do like any serious damage, I say that's a pretty freaking cool story to tell. Like, what's that? Yeah, you should, I hope he, like 
contacts us on Facebook. That was me. That was me. <laughs> well, I can tell you, like to this day, I, I the only interesting scar I have really is from a hardcore show in 1985. And um, I've, gr I've grown out the soul patch to ridiculous proportions. But if you look yeah. carefully enough, I've got a scar right there on my lip, which is in the exact shape of my upper teeth. Oh, no. And, you know, that was great. But I was watching uh, Scream and Marginal Man in 1985. Yeah. I'm pretty sure it was Scream who were playing. And this was at a place called Flynn's in Miami Beach, Florida. And, you know, I'm not the biggest guy in any room usually unless it's like a you know like a little person's convention or something or a preschool <laughs> so i thought i thought it'd be really cool to jump into the mosh pit and you know mosh around with all these gnarly ass skinheads and big punk rock dudes and i lasted about oh five seconds in there wow <laughs> I just, you know kind of extricated myself and i remember i was leaning against the bar looking up at scream playing the show while the mosh pit was in front of me and I looked over at the mosh pit just as this like totally random out of nowhere elbow just sort of came flying out of the pit. Uh. Boom! If I had been wearing glasses, they would have been knocked off just like that and drove my teeth right through my lip. Wow. And, and you know, blood gushing all over the place. And it's a cool story, though. <laughs> Did, didn't you say that we, 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 uh, when you played at the, at the original Anthrax, you jumped too high and your head went through the ceiling? Oh, God, yeah, that was in Stanford, at the original <laughs> Stanford Anthrax. <laughs> so, I, I got attacked by a skinhead girl. I mean, I, I swore I would never go to Connecticut again after that. Yeah. <laughs> too funny. Too good, but that, that really is kind of what it was all about, you know, just being um, young and wild. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and just blowing off all that steam and having the anthrax. Now that is a really key thing that people need to know about. If you weren't there, how would you even try to, how would you describe the anthrax? We'll start with you, Rob. Uh, yeah, how do you describe something like that? And again, us in the moment, we knew we were lucky to have something this special and something um, this unique, but we didn't really know that no one else had something like this, right? Or very few people. I know there's other great clubs, but uh, they were spread out and sparse. So this just happened to be one. Um, and I think Chris Daly's book is there's his, the Everybody's Seen book is the best way to do it. It just kind of, this was a pretty historic club. Everybody who was on tour would come through. I don't know how those guys did it, right? You know, you'd get everybody. And if you look down through those flyers, I mean, just the, the bands that came through and the people who went through those doors, it's unbelievable. So um, yeah, it was just right place, right time for us. And we were aware of how cool it was, that's for sure. Yeah, I know I can say just for myself that I certainly was because in Florida, gigs, you know, there, there were places to play and there were gigs, but they were few and far between, very hard to come by. And most of them were like nightclubs. So you had to be of a certain age and there were bouncers and there were drunks. And it was like that whole thing, you know, and it was great to have a place to play. But for me, the anthrax, which was all ages, no bouncers, generally speaking, no trouble. Yeah. And, you know, all these bands playing, it was nuts. It was great. Scott, don't just sit there silent. Tell us about the anthrax. Yeah, I was going to say, like, it's it's not hyperbole. Like, you know, and I think the grainy videos, the stuff that we have shows how how what the the turnout was at those shows was huge. I mean, you know, the uh, one one, you know, one point of reference would be our uh, our good buddy, Craig Colarusso, when Wide Awake played, he would have to like, you know, I can't you know, he would have to like stand and surround my drum set or whatever and just kind of you know you know go solid or whatever because like to keep the to keep the set from like falling over on top of me or whatever because it was like everybody everybody wanted to jump up on stage and grab the mic and you know like 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 rob i would ask you like like did you find it hard to play the guitar or whatever like were people like knocking it out of your hand oh, or? This, i think it's pretty well documented document i saw one video where i just actually go right off the stage did you guys i don't know if you saw that it's one of those on youtube where i just i'm right off 
Yeah. Um, the and, uh, often I would just seek refuge like behind the drum riser next to you. I'd be right up next to you. <laughs> yep, 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 yep. Oh, yeah, the drum set was kind of like an armor or whatever from all that craziness that was going on. I mean, I been through a few generate I, I also you know played some shows and did some stuff in the 90s and while it was it was the turnout was great and everything i just i just don't think it was as it was the energy and the insanity was as as much as the like the anthrax was as crazy as it got um that i just think that whole you know positive core straight edge whatever you want to call it was just like it was just the right place right time and and you know Anything after that was just try, kind of just trying to recreate it. Yeah, I would agree. It, were, it really was a perfect storm. And I think that the geography of where the anthrax is located, you know, yeah. basically midway between New York and Boston. So anybody who's touring and wants to go from New York to Boston, we got to stop in Norwalk, you know, yeah. it's, it's there. It's this incredible club. And the energy to use the word you used a second ago was always positive. You know, it's like it was, you know, people moshing and slam dancing and you know there was blood and people bouncing off the floor but none of it at least for a very long time at least until yeah. the very end none of it was mean spirited or malicious right i would agree yeah yeah it was just fun and um you know once again we got to salute the sheridan brothers brian and sean for just yeah. letting it happen just yeah. unbelievable what they built and what they had yeah. going yeah totally it's like anything went as long as you weren't maliciously hurting somebody or burning the place down or being stupid have at it and uh, they were like you know they they were visionary too i mean like they were into art you know they were talking about making the the zebra stripes or whatever um i forget Sean, i get i think it was brian whatever like he said that like you know he he the shown a um a, a, a what do you call it, like a kodak slide with a zebra print or whatever onto the wall and then traced it and painted it like you know so they, they you know they they did some interesting stuff you know they had that vulcan i think was the graffiti artist did the stuff on the entryway right so it wasn't just the music but there was also like a lot of like cool like pop art and culture stuff going on there too yeah and they also embraced all musical styles they had metal shows there oh, god <laughs> Yeah. yeah, weird experimental stuff. I saw Christian Death there and No yeah. Trend and all kinds of just really great things. Uh, one of my um, cherished flyers from the Anthrax you were mentioning earlier about the, the, the little quarter page sheets. Yeah. That they would hand out with just one show after another. Oh, I love those. Yeah. You know, and the, there was the one from, I think it was the summer of 90 when they were having one of some of their periodic legal difficulties and they had to cancel the entire roster. But that was like sub pop summer. So who was gonna play the anthrax the summer they got shut down? Oh, you know, Mud Honey, Tad, <laughs> Nirvana, you know, STP. It was just like, oh my God. Yeah. That would have been something. But I digress. See, it's so easy to digress when we're talking about this. You know, it's such a multi-layered story. Yeah. Kind of, well, that's if I if I could cut you off real quick, that's another cool thing. Like like we played shows with bands like Zombie Squad and Seizure. Uh, I'm trying to think of some other, like other like random bands that really didn't fall into our cat, you know, uppercut. Like like that we I, I met some really cool people and we play and and you know discovered a couple other like you know subgenres of uh, of the hardcore and punk scene by like playing those shows there. Uh, Rob, can you think of any other cool bands we played with? Um. I guess I get blurry on who we played with and who we just saw because we were always there. Whether or not we were playing, we were fans and, you know, um, just completely into what, you know, Sean and Brian were creating as a scene. So I would go to every show and see metal bands and see, uh, you know, yeah, punk bands. And, um, you know, like I said, I just, I had lots of friendships and we had lots of connections, but there was no internet. This is how you met people, right? So I've right. met a ton of people through skateboarding and now I have this new vehicle, music. I'm meeting all these other people and all different people from different places. And um, so I really just enjoyed that aspect of it. Um, trying to think of, you know, I don't really know that any stand out. We just saw, like, I felt like I saw everybody. Like, you know, it was, it was just uh, such a, a, again, a unique melting pot as Malcolm put it of just all styles, which uh, I benefited from for sure. 
Yeah, I think we all did. Well, you know what? Let's. Uh, I wanted to mention this earlier. Let's talk about some of your fellow travelers that we haven't addressed yet. Um, we'd be totally remiss if we did not address the band from that town, that one town over called Danbury. <laughs> aware. Yeah. Tell us aware. a little bit about Aware. What can you... Uh, because it was not, it was not like there was a I don't think there was a rivalry per se but it was definitely like you guys were running neck and neck. Yeah. We were all friends, all skateboarding. You know, Tom Kennedy had a ramp in Newtown. Sean Marcus had a ramp in Danbury, um, and we just would we were all friends. And however, when the idea to start a band came up, somehow John got Tom to join in, and Sean and Mike Feinson. You know, Mike Eddie, they were all living in the same neighborhood, essentially. So it made sense they formed a band. Um, and I never got the sense there was like a competition. It was like, it was like a together. It's like, wow, we can do this show in Danbury together. Or we could play, what was it? Images and Brewster together. Yeah. Um, and then we met at Images. That's where we met, I think, uh, you know, Jeff and Upfront and all those guys and John and Steve. And it kind of was like, a, okay, now, the, now there's three of us. What can we do now? Um, that's the way I felt about it. I don't know if you felt the same way, Scott. Yeah, I, I definitely think th there there was a, there was a a little bit of a rivalry, but no nothing like mean spirited or anything. Um, I didn't know those guys well enough, uh, but uh, you know, th th we they they had, well th first they had a seven inch, then we got the one on Schism. I remember the aware LP is freaking awesome. I don't know. Hopefully maybe somebody uploaded it to YouTube. I got to go have a re-listen to that, but that was like uh, a little more bold and more experimental than, than the, than the seven inch had some, like, a lot of, had a lot of guitar solos to my point earlier. Yeah. yeah. Who was, who was aware's guitarist? They had a few, but yeah. um, uh, you know, John was pretty uh, friendly and knew the guitar player. So the funny part is like, he, wasn't part of like the crew that skated, right? So skating, it was Mike Eddy, Mike Feinstein, Sean, um, and the guitar player, Nick, I believe. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. I don't think he really skated with us. So the social time, not, not as much time with him, but uh, certainly at the shows, everyone hanging out. Yeah. Hey, listen, well, I wanna see the comment section light up. We're talking about Connecticut hardcore. Can I just acknowledge how fucking rad the pressure release seven inches? The um, can't think it was New Beginning Records. Yeah. That that was one that was so ahead of its time. Uh, and I, I I listened to that. Go look go look for it on YouTube if you haven't heard it. It's, it's got like this one five minute song. It's like this metal uh, uh, opus or whatever, and then like two faster songs on the side too. But I so I I love that album or seven inch rap. Yeah. Scott, do you know, did Jay Crockett play on that? Didn't. No, I don't think uh, he was. Jay was like in that band for like a hot second. And he OK, was, I don't know what the time period was that Jay was in it. Yeah, they were like experimenting around trying to have like two guitarists or something. But I think it's just Tom, Tom, okay. whatever you say his last name. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I don't know if you guys remember this, but um, when we got the pressure release seven inch at Trash American Style to sell. Yeah. Um, I was a little bit taken aback by, I thought the cover art was kind of generic and I was talking to, who was, yeah. the, guy, who was the dude who had the label? What was his name? Oh, Mike Hartsfield? Yes. So, yeah. I said, so what's up with that? He said, well, you know, uh, it, it's kind of messed up. They, they, it was either they never sent the cover art. So yeah. Mike had to improvise it. And apparently, if I remember this correctly, they sent the wrong master tape. Huh. Yep. They, so that's true. So basically, the story behind that is, um, the singer D Doug uh, left the band, but had recorded his vocals, and this guy Ben came in and did a did a cover up. You know, like he redid it, but it went to pressing, and they screwed up and put Doug's vocals on. So, which are, are amazing. I mean, I, I haven't, I never heard the uh, people say the other one's good too, but like, uh, just like I said, just go, go Google it. I actually, I uploaded it to YouTube, but it's so good. That's, that's, that's kind of shit I listen to now, you know? Yeah, no, that's fine. I mean, that, yeah. that, that's one of those mysteries because you know me, I was a yeah. medical tape trader and recorder of stuff. I've still never heard the, the so-called right version of that seven inch. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. 
I don't know anybody who's got it. It's a it's a mystery. Yeah. Totally well, I'm friends with ben, I'm friends with Ben on Facebook. I'll see if he can track it down or whatever and uh, upload it. <laughs> yeah, find whatever closet yeah. that old cassette is in. We need it. We want that was it. that was that was a band that that we played with a lot. I I, I thought those guys were great and uh, you know up front, of course, we played lots of shows with. You talking about travelers and friends of Wide Awake? Yeah. Yeah, that um, was my that was my next. I was gonna say, well, let's cross the yeah. state line and go into Maya Pack. You know, so yeah. That's how you met those guys was just playing show. Yeah. Nicest guys in the world. Right. You know, they, they're, you know, uh, always down to play the shows and travel and goof around. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And they, um, they did a lot of touring too. I think they were one of the comparatively few bands from the scene who like really hit the road in earnest. Yeah. Yeah. I wish we could have done that. <laughs> yeah. Well, might as well ask how come it never happened. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> my, my, probably my dad <laughs> he was the he was the it was the nemesis of wide awake <laughs> oh the reason that that we probably didn't go further i mean there, there's a lot there's there's a lot of like you know woulda coulda shouldas but uh we definitely should have made a uh lp that's that's that we should have come up with the material to make a to make a a, a long playing record if you will and uh, didn't that, we have um, grand plans for like this big summer tour um, yeah. where we're going like, to get a van and really hit the road? And yeah, yeah. you were like 15 or something at the time. And your dad was like, I don't know if that's a good idea. Yeah. Um, and probably, you know, he probably was uh, correct on that. But it was <laughs> like, you know, at the moment we were probably, what, two years older or something, we were, like yeah. 17. And we're like, come on, you got to go. Yeah. And so we never did it. We never got to do that, like yeah it, it really was it really was just like a mini tour it was like going out to like ohio at the farthest and maybe yeah. maybe pennsylvania or something like that if i could go back in time i would have told him to pound sand and i would have just jumped in the van and gone but you know you can't you can't rewrite history yeah no and you probably would have had the minute you crossed over some state line somewhere there would have been a nice welcoming committee for the wide awake van and... oh it could have been yeah i didn't think about that <laughs> See, and that's, I'm glad you raised that point because I keep forgetting how young you people were. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You were young. You really only only could do so much. So yeah. it kind of makes sense. What? Yeah. One thing. I, the one thing I'd like to say about the whole wide awake thing is that, um, like, I, I don't think and Rob, d d uh, correct me if you disagree, but like, I don't think any of us ever thought this was. We'd be sitting here in 2021 talking about this. And no, it, definitely not. We were, yeah. if we had any, uh, any idea, we probably, you know, obviously would have kept going, but um, it was, it was just part of what we did as kids or, or, as, or what we did growing up. Like we skateboarded, we played music, right? We're into music, we played music. There was no blueprint for bands like this. There was no, oh, well, if you keep going, you can have a future. There was no, no yeah. thought of it. It was just part of, it felt like it was more natural. Like, this is what we do. This is yeah. our mindset. This is what we want to do. This is how we want to spend our time. And then, like, when the time came, I was still going to leave and go to school, right? That right. wasn't going to change what I was going to do. It was, it was still a part of me, but I'm still going to go down the path that I, you know, had laid out really without consideration. And I, and I think the same thing for John, he, even though, you know, he's the creative you know, force behind Wide Awake. And I think, boy, what if this guy just stuck with it? He's, he just is a great songwriter, great player. Um, who knows what could have, you know, happened, but I don't think it was even in his mind. He, yeah. he, you know, he went to do something else as well. So yeah, maybe we were all just tone deaf to what was going on and we probably should have been a little more aware, but uh, at, the, at that time, it just, you know, it wasn't a thought. Yeah, it was like it was just part of you know stuff we did. Like I was all I was equally into skateboarding. Um, you know, had I known, maybe I would have play, practiced and played the drums a little bit more. Maybe would you know we we only played a handful of shows and we barely ever had band practices. You know, Rob, you were you were up at college for a good portion, so you you know you'd come flying down or whatever and jam every once in a while. But it wasn't like I've been in bands where it's structured. It's like okay, we're going to practice twice a week and we got a show this Saturday. Blah blah blah. Da, da, da. And, and, and you know, it wasn't like that with Wide Awake. It was very like there was a lot of time and space between what we did, but it's still somehow it, we pulled it off. <laughs> 
Yeah, always, you know, as a spectator, I thought you guys always, you always nailed it. I don't remember yeah. ever seeing a crappy wide awake show ever. Yeah. You know? you know, except maybe barring some of the very early ones, but of course you're just starting out. So it's like, what do you really expect? Yeah, and John literally taught me how to play bass. Like, I, I didn't know what I was doing. I just, uh, he'd be like, move your fingers here and here. And just working with him over time, I just developed the same, you know, cadence as him in terms of picking and uh, all that stuff. So it eventually ended up working, but there was a, a, a bumpy road to get there for sure. He, he would get so excited. Like, you know, when, and he, he, you know, he's definitely one of the best guitarists I've ever played with. Um, but, you know, when he'd be like, okay, we're going to go into the mosh part here and it's going to just, you know, just hit, you know, hit it heavy here. Like, you know, he, he had all this stuff mapped in his head. He knew what he wanted. He knew what he wanted it to sound like. And uh, it was fun playing with, with all you guys. Yeah. Right on. I would like to send a shout out to John McLaughlin right now. Um, just in case people are wondering, I did, I asked John if he wanted to be interviewed. He was like, eh, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we got we got the rhythm section here and you know as i've always i've always said the bass is the place so I'm, yeah. I'm delighted to be talking to the wide awake rhythm section so john salute yeah but to your point scott this is one thing i love is like you know i can think of a riff right and then i would go to scott well here's a riff what do you want to do with it but john would come into a room and he had the drums the bass the guitar that he had everything figured out yeah. in his head on how yeah. it was sound, and he would just literally just tell you yeah. no no not here don't do that do this here yeah. and um it's quite different like if scott and i sit down it's it's like collaborative but john right. was like no this song is done it's in my head here's how we're doing it exactly yeah like i like i switched over i play a lot of guitar now and jam with my friend jack he plays drums and like quite honestly i don't care i, I just let him play what he wants to play um, cause I have faith in what he's doing, but like, yeah, John, John would be like, I want the drums to sound like this and play the beat this way. Like he had a lot of, like, he had a lot of ideas in his head. He's a great, great songwriter. Yeah. 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 Right. And he did, um, after in the, the post hardcore years, I knew he had, uh, a couple of bands and got into, uh, film scoring, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, he did. He had a band vinyl, which was kind of rock. Yeah. You know? um he's done movie stuff he's tried his hand at a lot of different creative things um you know which makes sense again he's just to me one of the most creative players one of the best guitar players i've been around so he's always just trying to i guess fill that creative urge whatever form it comes yeah and i think that also sort of differentiates guys like him and mike eddie and nick and that they were if i dare use the term more like musicians yeah and like I think that's fair. Art, you know that's good that, i think that's what what um you were talking about the the aware album earlier i mean it was the it was the the guitar interplay between those two dudes that i don't think anybody else really was doing that was that was kind of a unique thing yeah yeah right. now i gotta go crack down i hope somebody uploaded new lease on life to youtube because i gotta go listen to that after this <laughs> they were aware yeah. Um, that, that's a challenge for everybody out there. If you haven't done it yet, then um, please get on it. I'm, I'm yeah. sort of kicking myself because after Aware broke up and everybody kind of went their separate ways, um, might have been might have been Mike Feinson. He sold me the entire remaining inventory of Aware albums and cassettes. Hmm. I probably, I had hundreds of the damn things, or at least dozens, yeah. and. I didn't save one. It, it, I don't know how that happened. Is, and, and anybody who knows me, I save everything. I pride myself on having at least one of everything that came into the store during those years, whether it was a flyer, a demo, a record. And a lot of it's had to be sold off over the years, but I always had kept at least one. And I don't have that aware record. It drives me nuts. Mm. Anybody out there wants to mail me an aware record, um, my address is uh, actually you can see right there, P.O. Box 3626, Newtown, Connecticut, 06470. I need an aware record or cassette. Thank you very much. Help an old man out. Believe hey. Well, this is actually, I'm going to uh, kind of seize the bull by the horns right here. This is a really good time to break off. We've been at this for the better part of an hour. 
And this is like a very neat moment in the story to drop the guillotine blade on this episode yeah. of the shoot interview. Um, so I, I'm going to assume that you, Rob, and you, Scott, are down for talking about this stuff a little more, yeah? Sure. 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 Yeah. All right. So we're going to do an episode two of this interview. Wow. You know? Dude, we merit an episode two. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, at the rate we're going with uh, my little stack of props here, we might even... Uh yeah might be three you know we'll keep going till they're all there yeah yeah we're gonna yeah, talk we, about it all, all the, we gotta get into all the gossip the band breaking up you know the, the infighting <laughs> all of it we it's want like a, behind the music yeah, <laughs> exactly only better only so much yeah. better dude <laughs> yeah. so funny yeah man so i want to thank everybody who's tuned in right now and watched these three old guys getting all gassy and reminiscing. I've been having a blast. This is really cool. I have something in my eye. <laughs> oh, it's really, really, that's all it is. I swear to God. <laughs> um, I'm going to reiterate that we're driven by my desperate need and desire and want to sell some of these. Wide Awake, the end. Limited edition of 30. Each one hand numbered and hand manufactured by an honest to God American craftsman. In case you didn't see it at the beginning or you just forgot, look at that. It is transparent, baby. No two are alike. And we will have ordering information posted in the comments section for your spending pleasure. Remember, record collecting is not dead. You're welcome to buy 30 of these if you want, if I still got them. It's up to you. <laughs> We're going to see who's, who's weak and who's lame and who isn't. Just saying. So, Rob and Scott, thank you so much for part one. This has been great. Thanks, well, Matt. Good talk. Yeah, thanks for having us. This was fun uh, reminiscing. Absolutely. And uh, all you people out there in internet land, stay tuned for part two. We are now over and out. Good night.